In order to be productive, intense exercise must be brief. In order to be productive, intense exercise must be brief. Now that you've got the first two principles, another question comes up. Okay, Mike Messer, you did that one pretty good too. Hearing this in a broader context, I see what you're doing here in developing this theory. You're identifying the stimulus and then you're you're finding out how much of it we need. Just like with anesthesia medical science, they had to do a lot of research to come up with the chemical compounds that would be effective as anesthesia. Then they had to discover the proper dose levels. They used animals to do it. We, we, we're not quite as formally disciplined here in bodybuilding. We don't have universities. In fact, the university exercise physiology departments, from what I'm able to gather, are garbage. They're still teaching everybody to do three sets of 10, 10 reps, which is ridiculous. Where'd the number three come from? It's arbitrary. Again, there's three stooges. There's the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. There's three square meals a day. Some people even believe in triangle or pyramid power. They don't realize that they're violating a very important principle of science. There's no room in science for the arbitrary. For some people, three sets of 10, is, 10 reps is gross overtraining. Just as there are those individuals that don't tolerate exposure to high intensity sunlight stress as well as others, there are some individuals who don't tolerate, of course, high intensity exercise stress as well as others. For an exercise physiologist to tell everybody to do the exact same program is, is an admission of his ignorance about very essential and actually simple points of genetics and the body's response to stress. Now that you have the first two principles, now that you understand that exercise must be intense and brief, we want to know logically how many, how many of those intense brief workouts should we do for best results? And before I give you the answer here in a minute, let me explain two items quickly. Number one, you don't actually grow during the workout. The workout merely serves as a stimulus, a trigger once again. The workout doesn't produce the growth. The body produces the growth during the rest period. I'm emphasizing that distinction for your benefit here. I'm making a distinction between growth stimulation and growth production. The workout merely serves to stimulate growth. The body produces the growth during the rest period. Arthur Jones pointed out brilliantly a number of years ago that the only change that a workout can produce is an injury. If you impose upon your body a training stress or a force greater than its structural integrity can withstand, an injury will be produced immediately. The body produces the growth during the rest period, and it takes more than five minutes. It can take some people several days. However, the first thing your body does after the workout is not grow, but recover. When you're done working out, you don't feel the same as you did before the workout, do you? No, you're exhausted something was used up. The first thing the body does after the workout is put back what was used up. Restore, replenish, refurbish, recover, or as I like to say, compensate for the exhaustive effects of the workout. That takes time. It doesn't happen in five minutes. It can take several days for some people. Again, just as there are those individuals that don't tolerate high-intensity sunlight stress as well as others, it only stands to reason there are those individuals likewise that don't tolerate high-intensity exercise stress as well as others. It could take some people a couple days, some people three days, some people four days to recover or compensate for the exhaustive effects. It is only once the body has completed the compensation process that it will then devote its energy and resources to overcompensation, which is growth. The first thing the body does again after the workout is not grow, but recover, compensate, put back what was used up, bring the body back to parity, where it was before the workout. That takes time. Only once that has been completed will it then devote its energy and resources to overcompensation, now putting back a little bit more than was there before the workout. That takes time, too. It doesn't happen in five minutes. Both of these are distinct physiological processes. Both require time to complete. What do you think might happen if you were to exercise before full recovery takes place? Do you see where you'd be short-circuiting the growth process? We have learned through observation that it's always a mistake to train two days in a row. That is not enough time between workouts to allow for compensation and overcompensation. Most of 
my clients are making great progress training 72 hours, some even less. I've got some people in different parts of the country. I've got a few guys back in Maryland who are training once every seven days and literally reporting the greatest progress of their lives. They're doing, they're doing the whole body only twice a month. Now, you see, a lot of people are incredulous because their thinking has become perverted by reading the muscle magazines. Discard everything you thought you knew. Muscle magazines are not sacred scripture. They're not even science journals. Something I learned, and I'm still learning, is to be radical in terms of what I accept as truth. Muscle magazines, in fact, are popular organs aimed at the common, non-discriminating mind. Is that not true? You better believe that's a perfect statement of what a muscle magazine. A popular organ aimed at the common, non-discriminating mind. People who accept blindly, uncritically, whatever written material is offered to them.